We can choose our representatives. We can choose our presidents. We even can choose Donald J. Trump, but yet we apparently cannot choose our economic future and sovereignty. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. The motion before us today is this House would require democratic states to hold a national referendum to ratify any any free trade agreements. Now let us begin by defending the key aspects of today's motion. To begin with, democratic states, countries that elect their government officials through the popular vote. Now what are national referendums? A direct vote in which the population is asked to give their opinion on a particular subject or policy. To ratify is to provide with binding force. Now free trade agreements are deals between two or more countries to establish a commercial relationship where goods and services can be traded without payment of import-export tariffs. Now why are we debating this today? Because currently many countries around the world are in the process of or have concluded the signature of free trade agreements, raising concerns about the possible effects on local industries, jobs, overall economic growth, and the partial loss of national sovereignty. Now team proposition will prove two main things for you today. The first one being that this is the best way to legitimize a reduction in national sovereignty, and number two, that the economic implications require a direct popular vote. Now the framework for this debate, threefold. Number one, countries will hold a referendum with a single yes or no question after a treaty has been signed, providing that both for and against campaigns will get time on media to explain their views. Number two, the decision will be made on a simple majority basis and thus ratify or deny the agreement. Number three, this will be a last step after the negotiation of the, of the document and the normal course of approval, including a panel of experts, approval of the majority of Congress, and the will of the government. Now we have three main arguments for you today. The first one being the land of the, the, three, the free, the second one being the question is on the dollar, and the third one that will be developed by my second speaker. Now let us begin with our first main argument divided into two layers of analysis. In the first we'll deal about sovereignty, and in the second about the partial loss of it. Now let us begin with the land of the free. We elect governments. People hold power. The masses hold power and they cede over that power for a determined amount of time for a government to exercise that power onto a territory. That is called sovereignty. Now anything that undermines or reduces that power uh, means that the government loses part of its legitimacy to actually be a government. So people vote for their interests and for their future. It is the people's power. So basically anything that could limit that sovereignty is going against the very, pu pu uh, the very pu power of the people. Because people elect a government to exercise um, that power over a determined amount of time and not to limit that power. Now what is the problem here with FTAs? FTAs limit that sovereignty in three important aspects. Number one, import-export tariffs, so basically taxes. Number two, labor laws. And number three, environmental laws. And this is present in, for example, the transatlantic and the transpacific trade agreements, the, the brand new uh, deals that are being signed. So again, they would limit to the sovereignty of a state. Now let us begin with our second layer of analysis. How does this actually happen? Number one, tariffs and taxes. A problem such as the Trans-Pacific FTA, it requires the elimination of tariffs and quotas. What is the problem here? One, problem of the government actually financing itself through this loss of taxes, rises, and then, for example, protectionist policies, if a crisis appears and the government needs to protect its national industries, they become illegal. Someone, el someone else is deciding for the, for the economic policies of our country. Number two, environmental and labor laws. They're undermined, usually by developed countries imposing their wills over developing, over developing, developing ones. For example, the transatlantic FTA, we have incredibly vague language in the agreement in itself. It says, and I quote, the elimination reduction of all unnecessary barriers to trade. What is the problem here? The regulatory cooperation forums are set up, basically entities that are set up to smooth laws, env environmental laws and labor laws so that big corporations can increase their profits. For example, a US company wanted to build a toxic waste dump in Mexico that was against the law. But a company filed a complaint against the Mexican government, they had to do it, and the Mexican government lost 200 million US dollars. Number three, judiciary. Now, of course, if, they would, if there were to, to be a complaint between a company and a state, it would go to the courts, right? 
No. Arbitration private courts are being set up that are comprised of three elements. One, a company member, two, a country member, and three, an impartial. Third, what is the problem here? That we're not go only going against the sovereignty of the government actually exercising laws, but against the sovereignty of the judicial system of a country. For example, the EU, Canada, FDA, we've had over 500 of these instances actually taking place. So again, we've proven you. One, the essence of sovereignty in the state and its importance. And number two, the law of the sovereignty and power through FTAs. Again, requiring the population to actually give consent on just moment, sir, on this loss of sovereignty. But if you disagree. Uh, if there's such a big issue with the free trade agreement, why can't people call for a referendum themselves rather than force it upon them? Because the motion says this. I, get, I, get your, I get your point, I get your point, sir. Number one, you're recognizing that the people must a vote in a referendum in order to legitimize this loss of sovereignty. And number two, we're just making it easier for the people via the government. Now, uh, beginning with our second argument, the question is on the door. Here we'll be talking about the economy. Now, countries usually have a predominant way of producing their goods. It could be manufacturing, primary exports, or for example, technologies such as Germany. Now, when you go into an FDA, your economic and production system in itself changes, the structure of it changes, and usually very quickly in order to adjust to this new production system where you're trading specifically with these countries. Your economic, political, labor, uh, even social policies are uh, needed to be changed. And this, for example, leads to specialization. You mean developing countries usually exporting more, de uh, more primary exports. For example, Chile has signed over 45 FTAs, and in the year 2000, their copper exports were 45% of the total. 2016, 60%. So again, it's specialization, changing the economic situation of the country for a generation, again, requiring the consent of the population. Now, let us um, uh, turn to the hypothetical scenario of a crisis. You're tied with your partners in the FTA and you've changed your production system from earlier um, ways of doing so and you thus cannot uh, go effectively into the world if a crisis actually occurs. Now, who gets the greatest benefits of FTAs? Companies. Big companies. For example, in the US, a number of FTAs have been signed since 2009-2012 and big auto exports went up 82%. And this is completely asymmetrical. Why? Because the heavy lifting and the burden is, uh, is met by the poor and the vulnerable. For example, in Mexico, uh, after NAFTA, they lost over uh, 1.3 manufacturing jobs and agricultural jobs, uh, the ones that are actually being done by the poor, went down 30%. So they're doing, out of time, they're doing the heavy lifting. And companies have greater access to governments in order to finance uh, this and actually have FDA in the first place, lobbying. In the US, over $5.8 billion over the past years in lobbying, and companies got in return $4.4 trillion. So again, we're leveling the playing field for the poor, for the vulnerable, who are doing the heavy lifting. And again, even if we went into it and we wanted to get out for some reason, economic crisis or not, the average time for, to get out of it is seven years. So again, we need the consent of the population because they will generally do the heavy lifting, and thus the process of going out is very difficult. So we've proven you, one, the huge economic structural change, and two, the huge social change. That is why, Mr. Speaker, Team Proposition believes that our lives begin to end, that they will become silent about the things that matter. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, today we have we've seen a side proposition which would like people to have their say, which would like people to be in charge of the government, direct democracy, if you will. But at the same time, they would like us to force a regulatory system upon them. We see an inherent conflict as a result of this, which is why we would not require democratic states to hold such national referendums. What am I going to be doing for you today? Well, today I'm going to be talking about the, why it's unreliable to leave such a decision exclusively to the people. And I'm also going to be talking about how this harms the general political sphere and the political climate of a country. Before I get into this, however, I'd like to provide some extens extensive rebuttal sorry, to what the team proposition has brought to the table so far. One main point that they said is what was included in their model, is that governments are going to negotiate all the details and the people just have to sign off on that, just so that it agrees with the people's view. Well, firstly, you have to take into account all the time, money, and effort that actually goes into negotiating these things. So if, for example, let's say the people vote no, what about all that time and effort that actually went into negotiating that? That's going to go completely to waste. And as a result of Sir? this, no, thank you. And what's going to happen as a result of this is the political polarization that my first speaker talked about. Because one party is going to be campaigning heavily for it, 
this policy, one policy, one party is going to be campaigning heavily against this policy. But if one side wins and one side doesn't, it's going to create political tension between them, which inhibits long-term um, benefit for the country. Another point they said, we cannot sort of price on democracy. However, and then we brought up the point in reply to this that, well, general elections take place only once every four or five years, but they brought, sure. up, they brought up the point that legislative, legislative elections take place only <coughs> take place once every two years. They conceded the point that, yes, there are many elections, and yes, they do have significant costs. But yet, whilst saying that these elections do have significant costs, they would have us have even more of these elections and have even more costs inflicted upon the people. Another point they brought up was that these referendums are binding. <coughs> And this really links back sure. to our whole stance I'll take in just a moment, our whole stance about why we don't, we shouldn't require it. Because by binding governments to this, you violate the sole principle of democracy, which is to allow change to come about organically. So by forcing it, you're imposing on the sovereignty of the democracy. Yes, please. When you're giving away part of the people's power, then you need the legit, uh, sorry, legitimization through the popular vote. Thank you, and I'm very glad that you brought up the point about the people's power, because you're endorsing an idea of direct democracy. But ladies and gentlemen, the only direct democracy where people had to vote on every single issue in society was Athens in ancient Greece. And the reason why we resorted to a representative democracy as opposed to a direct democracy is because the issues, the social and economic issues of the day have gone increasingly complex as society has become increasingly complex and international. And as a result, it simply is not feasible to decide on such big issues by simply going to other views of the majority. No, thank you. Another point, they talked about that people can indeed understand, and their rhetoric behind this was, well, people can vote for general elections, can't they? People can decide um, for uh, presidents, prime ministers, why can't they vote for free trade agreements? Well, see, when we were talking about general and local elections within a country, what those people are talking about are the local policies. The ideas are very tangible and relate to the everyday lives of people. But in terms of international policies, Team Proposition themselves told us that these FTAs, or free trade agreements, are very specific in their nature and have a lot of economic detail to them. And it's because they relate to not just economics, but also foreign policy and international relations, that we believe that not everyone in society can make a well-informed decision. No, thank you. And before I get into the rest of my substantive, um, no, thank you. Um, and before I get into the rest of my substantive, I just want to talk about um, something that my first speaker mentioned, which is the fact about costs and turnouts. And this is really just to reinforce the idea that you, you shouldn't be requiring people because you brought up the example of Switzerland, right? And you again use our same example of Brexit. But what you have to realize about these about these cases is that these are when people wanted the change to come about organically. In the example of Switzerland, sure. people wanted the change to come about organically. No, thank you. Having said all this, I'll now like to move on to my case, which first is about the unreliable, um, the unreliability of living such a decision to the people. Yes, please. So we should just ask the people if they want to change presidents, for example, and make it seem an organic decision. Um, no, but what you're asking is for people to vote on a very specific issue multiple times, and I'm going to talk about the implications of this just now. I'm glad you brought that up, actually. So, firstly, why is it unreliable to leave such a decision to the people? Well, there's two reasons. Firstly, the fact that the majority of the population is inevitably going to be uninformed, and secondly, the abuse of political gain. Now, firstly, why would the majority of the sure. population be uninformed? No, thank you. When it comes to making decisions, which are the assimilation of both foreign policy and economics and international relations, you, we simply cannot expect every single person, let's say in this room for instance, to be both well-informed economists and have an in-depth understanding of mi micro and macroeconomics and to make longer sure. fiscal policy decisions and to be experts <coughs> foreign, foreign policy experts. That's simply not the job of the, of the everyday man yes, to make. I'll take you in just a moment. And because and because of this lack of information, unfortunately for most of the population, people are going to be liable to the impulsive behaviors. Don't you agree? Are you advocating for qualified voting? Um, sorry, you say that again? If you're advocating for qualified voting, because if only the people who actually know, for example, have to vote, then you're advocating for qualified voting. We're not, <coughs> we're not calling for, we're not making sure, and we're not po forcing any kind of voting. What we're saying is that if, in general, the people wish for such change to come about, if the well-informed people in society wish for some, such a change to come about, then it should come about. What we're arguing is not about the nature of the voting. We're talking about how the voting comes about. Um, moving on. Political gain. As you talked about, the people uh, usually don't get a say as to how their economic uh, policies are governed. 
Well, if you make such um, referendums um, so frequent, you have to also remember what people's psychology is. For, for example, the people who usually don't get a say within their communities to have a voice about economic policies. When we have this, these referendums coming up again and again, what you're going to allow for is for people to deliberately go for irrational behaviors just to draw attention to the issues of the day. People are desperate, according to Team Proposition, people are desperate to get their voices heard on matters. And if they, if they have a medium which occurs so rapidly, you're going to find an abuse of it by this a significant minority. Well, um, and yeah, and that's basically what I wanted to Sir? say. Uh, no, thank you. Uh, why it's unreliable? Because people can be very easily subjected to impulsive behavior. And just to bring up an example that you've talked about uh, as well. No, thank you, Donald, Donald J. Trump. People are subjected to impulsive behavior when it comes to such matters. And with regards to the political turnout. When such uh, referendums and such elections happen so frequently, an increase in frequency, if you will, by team proposition <laughs> stance, what happens is that people, it becomes a very monotonous situation. Okay, there's another referendum, and another, and another, and another. And people have everyday lives to go about and actually contribute to society. So what this is going to do is it's going to negatively affect the turnout. With every subsequent election that they would have hold, or every subsequent vote, you're going to reduce the turnout. And what this will do is this will negatively impact the uh, turnout for the actual election, which actually have major implications, such as the general elections, because people will no longer see the significance of voting, especially if the minorities are ignored on such issues. So what have I told you today? I've told you precisely why the price on democracy isn't necessarily putting uh, voting on whether or not people have the right to speak or not. It's more about the feasibility, the practicality, and really it's about people having a say to for change to come about organically and policies not being forced upon them, which is why we would not require such democratic states to hold referendums. Thank you. A man without a vote is a man without protection, and that is why, Mr. Speaker, we're proposing the motion this House would require democratic states to hold a national referendum to ratify any free trade agreements. Now, let me remind you the burden the side of the proposition needs to prove in order to win this debate. Two things. The first one is that this is the best way to legitimize a reduction in national sovereignty, and second, that the economic implications require a direct popular vote. We've already proven these two burdens by the two first arguments, which were the land of the free and the questions on the dog. Before beginning with the last argument for the side of prop, which is Dr. Who, we'd like to give some refutation to the points provided by y'all thus far. So first they brought this point on how people don't understand referendums, how we need experts. And they said they were going to develop it later on, but let's tackle it head on. First, we will tell you is that these are the same people that are choosing for the experts. Same people that are choosing for the legislators, and we believe that if they are capable enough to choose for a legislator or to choose for a president, then they can choose to ratify the future agreement. On this, let me ask you a question. Do you know what is harder, more technical and longer than an FTA? A whole electoral platform that includes legal, environmental, social, and economic policies. Yet the people are, in some way, <laughs> capable enough to understand all these policies that are not capable enough to understand a free trade agreement. We'd like to, give some, to get an answer from the second speaker. Then we would tell you the experts are already taking part of the process if we want to take them on the highest ground. This is simply a final ratification process. Why? Because we would have all the necessary steps but the addition of the referendum. We would say that this is just giving a veto power to the people. Third answer we would tell you is that since you're advocating for people voting based on the knowledge they have on the subject, we'd like to ask you another question we want the second speaker to answer. Are you advocating for qualified voting? Ladies and gentlemen, that is something we do not want on the side of the problem. Continuing on, they brought this point on how we would have low turnouts and this would not entail uh, less legitimacy. Two answers for this. First, that this is not necessarily the case. They brought one or two examples, let me give you three. First, Brexit, 76% turnout. Second, Scotland with 84% turnout. And third, Switzerland with an average of 66% turnout on the referendums. But even if, on a second <coughs> answer, we take them on the highest ground and assume that there will be low turnouts, we will tell you that in these places where we have low turnouts for referendums, we still have low turnouts for any type of general election. Thus, the same legislators that are voting on their side of the house for the ratification of this policy were elected by that same 10 or 20 percent. As we can see the case in the United States primaries when they manage around a 20 percent voter turnout. Yet they consider that their side of the house is in some way more legitimate. We don't see that point. Then they brought this point on how there was a lack of options. They brought this binary fallacy which I either had to pick yes or no and how to divide society. Three answers to this. 
First, we're assuming that people can't make an informed decision. We're assuming that people can't weigh the pros and cons between both sides and make a proper decision. We believe that is something they can't just assume without bringing proper evidence. Second, we will tell you that even if we take them on the highest ground, it still happens in elections. We can bring the example of the United States. Nowadays, we have two candidates, Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump, which are the two most hated candidates in the history of the United States. Yet, this November, people will have to elect one. That is dividing society nowadays, yet no one is questioning whether we should have presidential elections or not. So that argument falls on itself. And the last thing we will tell you is that this policy still goes through Congress. So it's not that people are going to have to vote for this or the other. The congressmen are still going to actually negotiate the terms and conditions of this agreement. Now, thank you. The next point they brought is how, why should we require these democratic states to actually hold a referendum but not ask, let the people ask for it? There's a couple of answers for this. First, we believe that it is a necessary step in the reduction, in the legitimization of the reduction of national sovereignty. We can't just let these people decide without having the popular support. That is part of national sovereignty, an argument my first speaker brought, which was never revealed inside the office. Second, we will tell you that in many cases, these people actually do ask for referendum, but since the government has no obligation in giving this referendum to the people because not all countries are the Netherlands, not all countries are Sweden, then in the rest of the countries, they simply just don't get a referendum. Why? Because the government has no obligation. So on our, our side of the house, we have more referendums, we have more legitimization by the people. And the third, third thing we will tell you is that nowadays we are requiring governments to hold elections for legislators. Yet, this is not undemocratic. Just because we require people to hold national elections, it's not undemocratic. So we see other argument yet again falls on their side when we see that their arguments are not mutually are not exclusive to free trade agreements, are not exclusive to referendums. They're just arguing against democracy as a whole. Then the next point they brought, which was the last one, is how this was very costly. And in fact, if we have many, many referendums, this would cost a lot of money. Three answers. First, that this is not necessarily the case. They brought no evidence. They brought no proof. It was just a simple statement. They said, oh, we would have many, many free trade agreements. We have elections every four years. First, elections happen every two years for legislators, plus the general elections, plus every municipal election. So in the end, it's many, many elections. And then they brought no evidence, no examples, no analysis on the fact of why we would have more free trade agreements. Nowadays, we have maybe one every three, three years, one every five years. And yet again, it's not very costly. Second, we would tell you that democracy has no price. We can't just simply be putting a price on democracy. We believe that democracy should be protected under every cost, even if we take the highest ground and assume that it is very costly. And the third thing we would tell you is that yet again, with that same logic, we should not have any type of election because they would all be very costly. Ladies and gentlemen, that argument yet again falls in itself. So now, let's move on to the last argument for the side of the prop, but before I'll take up your life. Seeing as they have nothing to say, we'll assume they concede to the points we provide on our side of the house. So let's move on to the last argument, Doctor Who. Two layers of analysis. First, let's get to the point of why representative democracies actually have limitations and why a referendum is actually the best way to legitimize this reduction of national sovereignty. First, we say that candidates don't represent the ever-changing will of the population entirely. Why? Because first, they don't adjust to the population's need when they change, since politicians don't necessarily change themselves with the population. Second, we would tell that politicians lie many times because of personal interest. There are countless examples for history. Third, we would tell you that politicians may change their minds suddenly from one day to the other without the consent of the people. We can bring the example of David Cameron, as he did with the Brexit. He was originally the one that proposed it and ended up opposing it in the past. Why? Because of, in the future, why? Because of personal interest he held. Second, we will tell you that since candidates are elected in terms of ideology or in some issues, in many cases, these people actually have to make a compromise on the future agreements or on the general ideology. Let's take the example of Hillary Clinton. She would be the typical Democratic candidate, right? But she is in favor of most free trade agreements. One moment. So she's in favor of most free trade agreements. So in fact, if the people wanted to choose someone that is against the free trade agreements, as most Democrat voters would do, they would have to elect Donald Trump and buy into all his xenophobic policies. So they have to make a compromise, and we believe that when it comes to an FTA, because of the argument presented by my second speaker, the economic implications being so high, this compromise is just way too high. Yes. If you believe that politicians are likely to lie to further their political, ca political capital and political agenda, why would you like to increase and demand people's exposure to such misinformation? What we would tell you is that on your side of the house, you are subject to the influence of law of lobbyists within these, poli these, these politicians. The, the legislators would be the ones that would be electing the ratification of the free trade agreements. On our side of the house, we get equal media exposure for both sides of the aisle. So we get proper ideas, we get the marketplace of ideas in which all ideas are presented on the table and the people can actually choose what is most representative to them and not what some politicians are lying or maybe even not telling them because they have no obligation to do it. So let's get to the second layer of analysis. 
we believe that since FTAs are so specific and bound in time, instead of represented by general ideology, the only way to get a proper legitimization is through a popular vote. We would say that since our, the, there will be a very specific opportunity cost, that a specific referendum on that matter would not compromise the general ideology of any candidate because of what they have to do for, to do for the FTA. We see how people can actually choose their legislators and their presidents on their ideology and then choose the FTA based on the specific policies that it's enacted. Therefore, we believe that on our side of the house, we actually lower this opportunity cost by getting a direct popular vote on this specific issue. Thus, we've proven the two burdens for the side of the prop, which were that this was the best way to legitimize the reduction of national sovereignty, and two, that the economic implications actually do require a direct popular vote. And that's why, Mr. Speaker, we continue to stand by the phrase that our lives begin to end the day we become silent about the things that matter. Thank you. Honorable adjudicators, ladies and gentlemen, worthy opponents, and fellow teammates, Welcome to today's debate. This House would not require democratic states to hold a national referendum to ratify any free trade agreements. Let's jump right into this, but before that, I'd like to outline our cases of opposition for today. I will be talking about the economic harms and the social harms of holding a national referendum to ratify any free trade agreements, and then our second speaker will be talking about how it's unreliable to leave such a decision to the people and the political harms of holding such a referendum. Now, before I get into my... Uh, before I get into my case, I'd like to give some light rebuttal to what was said by the first speaker of the proposition. First of all, they argued about the loss of sovereignty. However, the loss of sovereignty would be uh, the case if this motion does pass, because you are passing a forced referendum, because this motion states this House would require, meaning that this referendum would be mandatory, unlike in countries such as the Netherlands and Switzerland, where the referendums can be called for when the population want to pass a law themselves, they are, uh, no thank you, uh, in the Netherlands and Switzerland, as I was saying, when the people want to pass a law, they ask for a referendum, and then they, eat, uh, and then they hold the referendum, they either pass the law or they do not pass the law. However, in this case, the referendum would be mandatory, and so you are taking the de uh, democracy away from the people. They also are Sir. Sure. Yeah, you clearly didn't understand our model. The government has already negotiated this, and this is only a ratification process. That's what we clearly stated. So it's not that just if the motion passes, the loss of sovereignty occurs. With the free trade agreement in itself, it occurs. Could you repeat yourself, please? Yes, that the loss of sovereignty doesn't, doesn't happen just when the motion passes. It's happening with the FDA, and in our model, the government already negotiated it. Yes, the government negotiated it because... This is a point that my second speaker will go on to explain further. However, the governments are the ones that are negotiating this because they are the economic experts. Not everyone in the country is a trained or expert in the economy. They are not economists to be able to decide on something like this. And this is a point that will be expanded, such as the point that I said. It's oh. unreliable. No, thank you. Also, they talked about making it easier for the people. Uh, when I gave my point of information, they said it would be easier to just give the people the referendum rather than ha them having to ask for the referendum themselves. However, that undermines the very meaning of democracy, such as I stated before in the Netherlands and Switzerland. No thank you. Also, this is a point that I'll go on to state further. However, there is no way to regulate the costs that they mentioned, because the costs of such a referendum would be so vast. Allow me to get into my case. There are many economic harms of allowing a referendum to ratify any free trade agreements. There is a massive amount of money used to just hold the referendum. In Brexit alone, $142.4 million was spent as a cost on just holding the referendum. No campaigning money, no merchandise, no advertisements. Just wait on for a moment. There was a low turnout of less than three quarters sure. of the population going to vote, where in another democratic state there would be a higher turnout and they have a low population. So in other countries, there would be even higher costs. Okay. So you're putting a price on our democracy because with that ideology, we shouldn't hold general elections because they're too expensive, for example. If it's too expensive to hold a referendum with the same processes used for a general election, then you're putting a price on this. How can you say with that same logic that we should put a price? Okay, but this process would be very repetitive because every time there would be a free trade agreement in the process, you would have to spend vast amounts of money on this. And this is not just a one-off time thing. It's a very repetitive cost that is going to come about every time you want to hold such a referendum. And so this is going to take money out of the country faster than the money will be coming back in. And this is what I want to say. The referendum, you're investing the money into the referendum to give the people the right to vote and to empower the people. However, all these other costs since the cost is going to be too high, no thank you. 
since the cost is going to be high, it's not going to instantly funnel money into the country if there were no referendum and the free trade agreement does pass between the governments negotiating them alone. Money would instantly be funneled into the country. However, you are allowing the risk of money not even being funneled back into the country. So this money that you're spending on the referendum might not even come back into the country because in the vote, the, not, the vote might not even pass. The agreement itself might not even pass. And so money is going out of the country and not even coming back in. Also, the proposition wants to empower the people by giving them the freedom. However, as I stated before, this house would require, which is the opposite of democracy, because every time you want to empower your people, you're actually de-empowering them by destabilizing their economy and taking money out of the country faster than it will be coming back in. And so, how is this empowerment when you're disadvantaging your people every single time? No, thank you. Allow me to get into the social harms of this. First of all, a referendum will split the people in the country rather than unite them. Because team proposition want a direct democracy where everyone's voice is heard and everyone has an opinion on the matter. However, this will adopt a binary procedure in which because there are only two options and so this will split the country into two different sides. It will unnecessarily polarize the communities into yes and no. And this will start feuds between the people and it will turn all democracies into a two-party system where these two parties are always clashing, uh, clashing with each other and possibly leading to political tension between countries and between the people Sorry. themselves in the country. Just hold on for a moment. And so you're unnecessarily polarizing the community. It's something that can be dealt with, uh, dealt with with the government alone and at a lower cost. Okay. How is this any different from a general election? If you're afraid that the people will be divided, then let's just not hold any type of elections just because there will be two parties, for example. A general election uh, happens every not so often. Uh, for in the USA, for example, it happens every four years when you have such a general election. And so these costs follow up are not repetitive. They come around every four years. No, thank you. Uh, they come around every four years, not every so often. Not every time you want to have a free trade agreement, which are more often. A general election is a historical point in a country's time, uh, in a country's history, where it, they choose to either continue with what they have or uh, choose to move on to another future. And so, since it's such a historical point, it happens every not so often. However, as I stated before, these costs would be very repetitive and, would, uh, and as such would draw too much money out of the country than Sir? the money coming in. No, thank you. Also, my last point is, it divides the political landscape of the country because during the campaigning, the leaders of both parties, or the politicians of both parties, the yes party and the no party, would be using a harsh rhetoric to promote their campaigns towards uh, the other, uh, towards the other party. And so this divides the political landscape. And uh, despite the result of this in an ideal society, the politicians would move forward, they'd shake hands, they'd say yes, this is the result, and then they'd move forward to try and better the country. However, as we all know, it's not an ideal society, and they would continue to use this harsh rhetoric towards each other, and they would spend their time through this political tension and not trying to solve the other issues that the country has to handle. And so if this happens every so often, the country will never move forward because the politicians are always going to be in class with each, uh, with each other. To sum up, this motion must fall before our economy falls, people fall, and the democ uh, democracy falls. Thank you. It's easy, isn't it, to just stand up here and say that people don't know, that people are stupid. But what do they actually have to prove to us if they want this point to stand? They actually have to bring evidence and analysis to prove that the people don't know what they're doing. And because team opposition here did not engage with our case and only based their case on the fact that people may or may not know, it's because we have taken this debate. The two main things we have to prove to you today is the first thing that this is the best way to leg legitimize the loss of sovereignty and the second thing is that the economic implications require direct popular <coughs> vote. Two things which they couldn't engage upon. So I'll divide my speech into two main parts. I'll begin with a reputation, divide in clarifications, the questions and the points of clash and in my second part I will summarize the constructive case for team composition. So beginning with the clarifications. They told us at the start of, the, of this debate that if it's such a problem, why don't we call for it, them, why don't the people call for it themselves, and why don't we have an organic way of solving the problem? 
So there are many answers we have to this. First of all, that many times when people do actually call for these referendums and the governments don't listen, the second thing would tell you is that we're not against the people voting, we're just going one step ahead and saying, okay, we're going one step further and giving them the vote before the people can actually ask. And the third thing we would tell you, if everything has to be so organic, and if democracy is so because the people want to, why is it that we don't just wait for the people to tell us, okay, we need to change our present? Why is it that we have this institutionalized? Okay, it's because we are uh, we're not letting the governments abuse. It's because we need to have this institutionalized because you cannot wait for the people to have a revolution every time they have to change the president. So they also spoke about the loss of sovereignty will happen only if the motion passes. First of all, we explained this in a point of information that this did not happen. And the second thing they do understand is that in our model, we already explained that the loss of sovereignty will happen with any FDA. And what they have to tackle here is if this loss of sovereignty is, um, and this, if this loss of sovereignty um, doesn't make the people uh, doesn't make the people have to vote for this, which they did engage upon. This was told us that they want to that we want to force a referendum on the people, and that this is undemocratic. First of all, we're not for forcing anyone to vote for anything. We're just giving them the option of uh, voting in a <coughs> referendum. The second thing we would tell you is just give no thank you. Um, and the second thing we would tell you is that in a democracy, they also give people the vote for president, for example. So we don't see how all of the um, how all of the harm are mutually exclusive to the case of free trade agreements. They also told us that we were debating direct versus representative democracy. First of all, this isn't the debate which is here an issue. And the second thing we would tell you is that they needed to engage with our argument, not invent one for us, because we never said that we were going in favor of direct democracy. We were, my second speaker clearly explained that we are here to compromise where representative democracy clearly is, um, is has some flaws. So they didn't engage with our sovereignty argument, and they didn't even engage with the, uh, our, the, our argument about the limitations of representative democracies. But moving on, what were the questions that we asked the team opposition and we expected a clear answer to? The first one being that how is this any different, how all of the things they are saying are mutually exclusive to FDAs and how they are not different from general elections because um, to this they said, okay, well, general, no, thank you. Um, to this they said, well, okay, general elections are only held every four years, for example. First of all, this doesn't really answer how they're, what they're saying isn't mutually exclusive to FDA. Is mutually exclusive to FDA. Second of all, we already explained that this isn't true. And the third thing we would tell you is that um, is that FDAs also don't happen as frequent as they, as they would want to think. And the fourth thing we would say is that even if we were to take them on the highest moral ground, they have conceded that the people have to vote anyway. So they also, we also asked them, are you advocating for qualified voting? So what did we hear from them? Exactly this. Silence and a very confusing thing that, uh, that the second speaker said. But we didn't actually hear for this because when they stand up here and say, okay, not everyone knows economics without really giving an analysis, and that only people who know have to vote, that is the definition of qualified voting. So moving on to the first point, Cash, about the referendum. So we had a team opposition that stood up and, and said that money is an issue and money is too much apparently and that the referendums cost too much money and too much effort. So the first thing we would tell you and that we told this throughout the three, uh, throughout the three speeches that this is basically putting a price on democracy because we don't do the same analysis when we're analyzing a general election. The, third, the second thing we're doing is that this is a contradiction because if they said in their first speech that they would want to advocate for people actually voting, how is it that they want now to say, okay, no, don't vote because it may or may not be too expensive without actually giving really analysis on it. So they also said about the money will go out of the country without giving a complete explanation. They just said that the money will flow out magically. And the second thing we would tell you is just because they say and give no analysis doesn't mean that it has to stand. They also spoke about it splitting the people up and the, and the politicians as well. So first of all, any vote on any single thing in life, in a general election or whatever, divides people. But is that enough not to give the people a vote? We don't think so and they didn't explain why it should. The second thing we would tell you is that they actually gave no example. But the third thing we would tell you is that even if we were to take them on their highest moral ground, we would see that this is not actually mutually exclusive to FDAs. And they also spoke about this not being democratic, undemocratic. But first of all, what is more democratic than giving the people the vote? What is more democratic than letting the people vote about their future? What is more democratic than this? Our side of the, um, and they also, uh, on the second answer, would say that um, they also brought up no proof and no analysis on why this is actually undemocratic. And they also spoke, um, spoke about the effort. So here, it's the same thing that we would say, that even if we were to have all this effort, even if we have the negotiations, it's not, even if the Congress, for example, didn't make this FDA approved inside the negotiation process, we would have the same, the same result as if the people were the ones who said no. So we don't see how that also is mutually exclusive to the people voting. And moving on to the second point of clash, about the people. 
So they came up here and said that the people don't know, that politics is actually more tangible for them, for example, and that they don't know foreign policy. Okay, so first of all, if they bring no proof and no analysis and actually examples where they can prove that people don't know, then we can make this point stand. The second thing will tell you that it's offensive and clearly an easy way out just to say that people don't know without providing any evidence. And the third thing it would tell you is that even if we were to take them on their highest moral ground, these are the people that firstly vote for the representatives which they and us proven to you, uh, which they and us agree that are the ones who have to negotiate this process so we don't see why they wouldn't be capable of voting for the referendum, uh, for the FDA itself. And the second thing we would tell you is that what is more complicated than that, having an economic policy of a candidate, a foreign policy of a candidate, uh, and other policies of a presidential or general election platform. So we don't see how that argument really applies. <coughs> They also spoke about the psychology, of the psychology of people without giving really examples, just saying that people had a abrupt psychology and they were going to be um, inferentiable. But the second thing we would ask them is that giving the people vote psychologically wrong, we don't really hear, and it's too late for the first, the first speaker to present analysis on it. And the last point they brought up is the thing about the turnout and how maybe the people will end up voting too much. So first of all, what does it mean voting too much? The second thing we would tell you is that FDAs don't happen as often as team opposition would like to make us think. And the third thing we would tell you is that in these countries we would see that in the general election we have the same turnout as it happens uh, for these FDAs, for example. So moving on to the summary of our constructive case. In our first argument about the land of the three, we spoke about how the essence of all states is the use of the sovereignty of the government, the sovereignty that the people gave them to delegate uh, this sovereignty, not the reduction of it, and how the FDA in any form reduces sovereignty on taxes, on tariffs, and on working conditions. So because this, the sovereignty of the people is being reduced, we've proven to you that the referendum has to be held. In our second argument about the economy, we explained to you how this FDA is unique to the economy because it changes a lot of aspects like taxes, like tariffs, and it makes the whole economy, like Chile for example, um, adapt to this FDA. So this is unique in a way where all people and mostly the lower classes will be affected. So it needs all sector support and it needs the people to vote. And our third argument about Doctor Who. The representatives of demo the representative democracies have limitations. The politicians can change their mind and they can't we can't afford it here. And we don't um and, um, they, and they are elected on ideology. People would say that sometimes you elect a person on their ideology, but not exactly on the point of FDAs. So, um, so this is why Team Proposition stands here by the phrase that our lives begin to end the day we become silent about the things that matter. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Here we're in a debate about referendums and about apparently sovereignty, and where Team Proposition has told us that by forcing stuff on people, we are apparently um, reducing the undermining of sovereignty, which is something that the team opposition haven't understood. Now, the point that the team opposition have brought to the table is mainly the cost of the referendum and how we think this would not be beneficial. We have addressed the fact that um, we don't believe that we have the right people voting in this referendum. We don't believe that people are necessarily, these, the majority of the people are necessarily qualified. We can take the example of Brexit. Many people used Brexit as a protest vote. They wanted their voices to be heard because they felt the government had ignored them. But in the result is, we have a result that the majority, it turns out, of our country doesn't like. We don't want to be dragged out of Europe. And we personally, as team opposition, believe that this referendum is providing more room for manipulation of people and undermining them. No, thank you to all of you. Undermining their sovereignty. And it's giving the chance for people to be exposed to more misinformation. Now, um, we talked about politicians again and changing their mind, and we were given the example of David Cameron changing his mind on Brexit. And that was a party mandate, that wasn't his choice. And when parties potentially have their best interests at heart, not the people's best interests at heart, they could manipulate this motion and bring in free trade agreement. No, thank you bringing free trade agreements that aren't actually good for the people, that would not be beneficial for anyone. And you are, Madam. no thank you, you are forcing these referendums on people. As we've said, if people really feel that strongly, they will call, and yes, there are people who call for referendums, and then the majority of the people are happy. But when they are forced to accept something, then it's not democratic. Yes? Was the Brexit referendum forced on the people? Were the people actually forced to go and vote? Or did they just have the option and go out and vote? OK, well, you're telling me that, oh, well, they don't have to vote because, you know, it's your choice. But that seems kind of ridiculous because then you're getting a small part of the population, potentially less than half, for telling you what they want. You're not getting an accurate representation of what the people want. 
When you elect a leader, or when you elect a representative to your council or to your government, you're electing them because maybe you support their party, but mainly you support their policies. You believe that person is qualified to run your country, and part of running a country includes trade. So these people often who have spent many a lot of time studying this in order to get to their quest of being the leader of this country. They know what they're talking about. They work closely with economists who will help to draw up the free trade agreements with economists in both of the countries. No thank you. And therefore, we personally believe they are much better qualified to give us free trade agreements. Now, free trade agreements, and the point of free trade agreements, no thank you, is for them to be mutually beneficial to each of the countries signing. Everyone will get the benefit. Not everyone understands that as team composition seem not to, but we, we believe that these economists who understand it are better than giving it to the people who... No. Right, so we've also seen, let's take the example of the Scottish independence referendum, which was a 55% no vote to leave in the UK. And I, we have seen the negative effects of the referendum in Scotland. They were promised action as they voted no. This action hasn't happened. We haven't had our devolution from the UK government. And it has caused insane political tensions within the country. There are regularly clashes where people are arrested because of fighting between yes and no supporters. Support for the <coughs> leaving the UK has grown because they feel that they are being ignored. And we do not believe that it is sensible to have these referendums because you're, in, you're increasing instability in the country. If we look at the aftermath of Brexit, our government has practically collapsed. Labour is in the middle of infighting where they're voting against their leader. Our Prime Minister has stood down. There, there was fighting within there. We are not seeing a stable country, no. Because, no thank you, because of these results of these referendums. And you want to tell me that you're forcing these referendums on people every time you want to sign something that is mutually beneficial for the country. On that. Yes. The people in the United States are about to elect Donald Trump as their president. Should they not be allowed to get a vote? They do get a vote. That's what you do when you elect the people. But no one is, <coughs> we're not forcing something on them. Um, we also talk about the fact that um, elections are every four years and therefore the cost is irrelevant. Elections are so we don't get dictatorships. We don't have people running the country. These free trade agreements are mutually beneficial, as I've said. We have people that don't understand free trade agreements. So that is why we don't think, we're not putting a price on democracy. We're saving money for, especially if it's a country that's a low income country. And this free trade agreement would make the difference to their economy. It would mean they could now be into making profit. It would be great, but they've got to hold this referendum, which will cost so much money, that will put the side, that will side on the actual running of the country, as we have seen with the Brexit campaigns that have been going on for over a year. The actual important stuff is being put to the side while everyone argues over yes and no, and while the public are mis given misinformation. It's the, we, don't believe that this is necessary to spend the money. We're not putting a price on democracy at all. In fact, we're saving democracy because we're not forcing anyone on anything, which is the opposite of what team proposition will do. No, thank you. So, and also they've said that, well, we're taking away people's chance of voting on their economic fu future. Now, free trade, no thank you. Free trade agreements are not the only thing that affects our economic future. And as I've said once again, I, it's mutually beneficial. Doesn't everyone want something that's mutually beneficial? And it's not all of the economy. So many other factors affect the economy. By team proposition stats, every time something affects the economy, we should just have a referendum on it, because that's what the law says, yes? If we have an issue with this free trade agreement, can we change our national laws? Repeat yourself, please. If we have an issue with the free trade agreement, can we change our national laws, or are we bound to the treaty we signed? The economists and the people who know that this free trade agreement will be best and will only sign it in the country's best interest because that is their job, <coughs> then will only sign something that is positive. If people have such an issue with the free, with the free trade agreement, we're not saying that they can lobby the government. We're not saying that something can't be changed or terms can't be renegotiated. We're just saying that it's utterly ridiculous to force a really expensive referendum Follow on people, no thank you, who generally don't have a deep enough understanding of something so important that it's just, it's not, it's not logical. If people have that issue, they can lobby the government and things can be changed. The whole point of team, the whole belief of team opposition here is that forcing anything on a democratic state is not democratic. 
We believe that it's not, money-wise, it's not sensible for the people, for the economy, which they think they're trying to save. We've appreciated that it's going to cause political instability and tension within the country, which no country needs right now, especially the state that our world is in. We've said that people are going to use this as a protest vote to hear their vote heard and potentially end up voting for something that is negative for their country because there will be so many elections. And we've said that it's just not rational for us to have people who generally don't understand the full meaning of free trade agreements going to the polls whenever the government, who knows what is best for the country, wants to sign it. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, this has been a fantastic debate in which Team Proposition has constantly agreed with every single thing we've brought to the table today. And how has this been done? Really, well, it's on three main grounds, and the three main points of clash, if you will. The first thing was about the qualification of voters, whether voters are actually, should be eligible to vote on such issues. The second thing was the idea of sovereignty, and how Team Proposition presented a, what, what we viewed as a rather twisted definition of sovereignty. And finally, the cost, the fact that you can't put a price on democracy, or whether you should. So I'll begin by going through each of these in order. So firstly, the qualification of voters. On this point, the idea that Team um, Proposition brought to the table is that if people know enough to make concrete decisions in, let's say, general elections and legislative elections, why cannot they be well informed to make decisions about free trade agreements? And what we told you is that, firstly, there is an inherent difference between these, ge these general elections and the rather, as Team Proposition put it, specific free trade agreements. But firstly, they lack the inherent flaw that was in their logic was that they said that people know, if people know to elect the proper leaders through general elections, but they never said why, if people know enough to elect the proper leaders, why they need to vote on these leaders' decisions subsequently. If they can make uh, informed decisions about leaders who will make the best decisions for them, why do they again need to go ahead and vote on these decisions? They never really developed that argument further enough to show that the, lo that the information required for general elections follows through in the same fashion for free trade agreements. Whereas what we said on this issue was that, yes, the, the whole point of general elections and the issues surrounding them are inherently a lot more local, intimate, and tangible for, for, for the majority of the population to understand. And what we told you was that the issues surrounding free trade agreement, which is also with international foreign policy and economics, that the issues required for that are a lot more are a lot more different in nature. And as a result of this, if people feel the need, then they should be allowed to have a referendum, but it shouldn't be forced upon them. Moving on, the whole point about sovereignty. Team Proposition came up here and told us that free trade agreements are reduce the sovereignty of a nation, and as such, the individuals should be allowed to vote if they, if they would like to engage in such an economic endeavor. But firstly, they refuse to acknowledge the point that FDAs are inherently mutually beneficial and countries negotiate that on that basis. And secondly, what they refuse to engage with is the fact that you're giving up one form of sovereignty violation, which in their, which in their world was having free trade agreements, for another policy, for another form of sovereignty violation, which is having a policy forced upon you, have governments having a lack of autonomy, a country of people having a lack of autonomy as to how their country should be governed. They're not able to show us how it is sustainable and indeed beneficial to give people the deciding power on, on issues which have such wide-ranging implications. And the final thing was the idea of the cost. They said that we can't put a, money, a price on democracy. Uh, we can't uh, put a price on people deciding their economic futures. And yet, that's exactly what they're doing in their world. They're forcing an ideal, an expensive and extremely costly ideal on people without giving them the say as to whether they even want such a forced policy in place. And they're not giving the people to decide their future on the economic issues. So really, what they've done today is they've traded your autonomy to decide on international, free, on international economics for local economics, which is why we would not require democratic states, but rather we believe that democratic states deserve the right to, for this change to come about organically as opposed to forcing it upon them. Thank you. Do we have the right people voting for these referendums? And the answer is no. Why? Because in the status quo, only legislators, those who manipulate people based on party matters, are the only ones who get a say. That is why, to analyze what we've seen in this debate, we'll answer three questions. 
First one, which side is more democratic? Second one, do people know enough? And third, how do we legitimize sovereignty? So let's get to the first one on which side is more democratic. Coming out of the off, they said three things. First, that we're forcing people to decide. Second, that our representatives are enough, they are fine. And third, third that if we have low turnouts, then our legitimacy falls. What did we say to this on some of the problem? We told you that requiring a referendum prevents the abuse of power from elected officials. Since people nowadays, in our side of the house, they will have the final votes. Plus, about even more than this, we already require elections for legislators every two years. And this is still democratic on our side of the house. We don't see why requiring a vote is undemocratic at all. Moreover, we told you that our representatives have limitations and there is no perfect matching candidate. There is no certain candidate that is perfectly matching on every issue. And we told you that we cannot make a compromise on FTAs. Uh, that was our second argument, something that the opposition could be refused to clash on. But third, we told you that the turnouts weren't as low as they wanted to set in this debate. We brought examples, three in fact, but moreover we told you that these turnouts are equal to those in general elections. And since we actually legitimize the power of these legislators to pass laws, because of this 20% turnout, we believe that on our side of the house we get equal or even more legitimization, and therefore our side is the most democratic side in this debate. The second question is, do people know enough? On their side they said that people don't know enough, and they said, and I'm quoting, we can't expect people to know economic policies. We told you in the side of the prop, and they showed no proof of this, since they brought no examples, no analysis, and no statistics on how people actually are as stupid as they say they are. But moreover, we told them, since we're expecting people to know enough on every issue on the electoral platform, we can expect them to know enough on these specific economic issues that moreover are going to get media time, as we said in our model, something they completely refuse to clash on yet again. So if these happen as often as they want to show, then people will get so much media on them, that they will end up knowing a lot about these topics, simply by absorbing what they get from the media. Yet again, that point falls for our side. But to this they said, oh, but we need experts. Or in our model, we told you how the experts are already taking a part in this. These are the same experts that they so love on their side of the house. They're already negotiating the, negotiating the terms and conditions of these deals. The people only get a veto power or if they want or not to ratify the <coughs> agreements. But moreover, we told you how they are advocating for qualified voting, which brings more detriment and is undemocratic since everyone, since not everyone votes, but everyone gets affected by the policy. Something they did yet again did not clash on their side. So yet again, on the side of the proposition, we get the best of both worlds. We get the experts, we get the people, and we get the democracy. So now, the last question is, how do we legitimize this sovereignty? How do we legitimize the reduction in national sovereignty, which we're giving on to these FTAs? On the side of the op, they told you, we give it away all the time, so it really doesn't matter. We're not holding referendums for everything. And second, they said it's way too costly. For this, we answered that the power is held by the people, not by the government. That the government is only in place to exercise power, not to trim it away and give it to an international treaty. And in order to limit our sovereignty, we need to get the, order, the owner supported, the owner's approval. And who is the owner? The people. So yet again, if we want a reduction of sovereignty, we need to get the owner's approval. But we see how other arguments are not exclusive to FTAs. So yet again, the whole case falls. But then they said in the, in the third speaker, which again we consider a bit too late, they said, we only sign good policies. So yet again, we don't need the people's support. These are already good policies. To which we answer this is not always true, since they themselves brought the case of politicians abusing their power because of party policies, as the case of David Cameron. But moreover, we tell you that every deal, as much as great as it can be, can actually go south if the, if the global situations change. We're interdependent with another country, that's what my second speaker told, told you, and even if they are great, if the economic policy changes, we cannot change our national laws. Why? Because we've lost our sovereignty. That is why, Mr. Speaker, we continue to stand by the phrase that our lives begin to end the day we become silent about the things that matter.